Hello, I am Haru. Welcome to Haru's Halls of Literature, where me, the man reading the book, will be reading books. It doesn't get more simpler than that. Our first book we're going to start reading is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. This is a fantasy book, one that I have never read myself. So hopefully, we very much enjoy this book. Now, there's 29 chapters to this book. We're going to be reading in six-part chapters, give or take. There's about 290 pages. So do the math if you must. We're going to be starting in the prologue. Now, let's begin. Prologue. It doesn't give us a page. Let's begin. Viv buried her greatsword in the scoured skull with a meaty crunch. Black blood thrummed in her hand and her muscular arms strained as she tore it back and out in a spray of gore. The scoured queen gave a long, vibrating moan and then thundered to the stone in a heap. With a sigh, Viv slumped to her knees. The persistent twinge in her lower back flared up, and she dug in the knuckles of one huge hand to chase it away, wiping sweat and blood from her face. She stared down at the dead queen, cheers and echoed from behind her. She leaned closer. Yes, there it was, right above the nasal cavity. The beast head was twice as wide as she was, all improbable teeth and uncountable eyes, with a huge underslung jaw, and in the middle, the fleshy seam she'd read about. Jamming her fingers into the fold, she pried it open, a sickly golden light spilled out. Viv slid her whole hand into the pocket of flesh, curled her fist around a faceted organic lump, and yanked. It came free with a fibrous ripping sound. Fennis moved to stand behind her. She could smell his perfume. Is that it, then? He asked, only a little interested. Yep, Viv groaned as she hoisted herself to her feet, using black blood as a crutch. Without bothering to lean the stone, she stuffed it into a pouch on her bandolier, then propped the great sword on her shoulder. And that's truly all you want, Fennis squinted up at her. His long, beautiful face was amused. He gestured at the walls of the cavern, with the scalvered queen head entombed and told wealth within sheets of hardened saliva. Wagons, chests, and the bones of horses and men hung suspended amidst gold, silver, and gemstones. The shiny castaways of centuries. Yep, she said again. We're square. The rest of the party approached. Rune, Tavis, and little Galena brought with them the exhausted but exalted chatter of the victorious. Rune come muck from his beard. Galena sheathed her daggers, and Tavis glided behind them both, tall and watchful. They were a good crew. Biff turned away and strode toward the cavern's entrance, where dim light still filtered through. Where are you going? hollered Rune, in his rough, affable voice. Out. But aren't you gonna... began Galena. Someone shushed her. Most likely Fennis. Viv felt a prick of shame. She liked Galena the most and probably should have taken the time to explain. But she was done. Why drag things out? She didn't really want to talk about it, and if she had said anything more, she might change her mind. After twenty-two years of adventuring, Viv had reached her limit of blood and mud and bullshit. An orc's life was strength and violence, and a sudden sharp end, but she'd be damned if she'd let hers finish that way. It was time for something new. Chapter 1 Viv stood in the morning chill, looking down into the broad valley below. The city of Thune bristled up from the bed of fog that hazed the banks of the river, bisecting it. Here and there, a copper-clad steeple flashed in the sun. She had broken camp in the pre-dawn dark, and her long legs had eaten up the final few miles. Black blood weighed heavy on her back. A scoured stone tucked in one of her inner jacket pockets. She could feel like a hard, withered apple and reflexively touched it, 
through the cloth from time to time to reassure herself it was still there. A leather satchel hung over one shoulder, stuffed mostly with notes and plans, a few chunks of hard tack, a purse of platinum chits, and assorted precious stones, and one small, curious device. She followed the road down and into the valley. As the fog burned away, and a lonely farmer's cart, tottered by, stuffed with alfalfa. Viv felt a rising sense of nervous elation, something she hadn't felt in years, like a battle cry she could barely hold in. She'd never prepared as much for any one moment. She'd read and questioned, researched and wrestled, and Thune had been the city she'd chosen. When she'd crossed every other location off her list, she'd been absolutely positive. Suddenly, that conviction seemed foolish and impulsive, yet her excitement remained undimmed. No outer walls surrounded Thune. It had sprawled far beyond its original fortified boundaries, but she sensed herself approaching the edge of something. It had been ages since she'd stayed in one place more than a handful of nights. The duration of a job, now she was going to put down roots in a city she'd visited maybe three times in her entire life. She stopped and looked around wearily. As the road wasn't entirely vacant, the farmer's long gone into the mist. Withdrawing a scrap of parchment from her satchel, she read the words she'd copied. Well nigh, Thonic Line, discovered stone fire, draws the ring of fortune, a speck of heart's desire. Biff tucked it carefully away again, exchanging it for a device she purchased a week before from a Thumus scholar in Arvine. A witching rod. The small wooden spindle was wrapped in copper thread, which covered the runes inscribed along its length. A wishbone of ash was fitted over the top, and into a groove, so it spun freely. She held it in her fist, feeling the copper thread absorb the warmth of her palm. The spindle gave a barely perceptible tug. At least she was fairly concerned it was a tug. During the Thumus demonstration, there had been a stronger pull. Viv pushed down the sudden thought that had been a parlor. Tr trick. As a rule, folks with fixed addresses avoid swindling, and walk twice their height who could snap at a wrist if they shook hands too firmly. She took a deep breath and strode into. Thune with the witching rod before her. Thune's wakeful noise rose as she moved farther into the city. At the outskirts, the buildings had been mostly wooden, with some river stone foundations and spurred. The deeper she ventured, the more stone prevailed, as though the city had calcified as it aged. Muddy dirt gave way to a smattering of stone lanes, then cobbles near the city's core. Temples and taverns huddled around squares featuring statues of people who probably used to be important. Any doubts about the witching rod had evaporated. It definitely pulled now, like a living thing. Brief twitches growing into instant tugs. Her research hadn't been in vain. Lay lines were curly, threaded beneath the city. Powerful avenues, a thumic energy. Scholars debated whether they grew where people settled or gathered folk near like a warmth in winter. What mattered to Viv was that they were here. Finding a potent lee line was only the start. Of course, the little wishbone of ash would twitch left and right, tugging one way for a time before reversing and pulling like a fish on a hook in another direction. After a while, she didn't have to look at it. The feel of it was enough, and Viv paid more attention to the buildings as she passed. The device ushered her down a major thoroughfares through the schoogling alleys that stitched them together, past blacksmith and hostels, and markets and inns. There were few people her height on the street. She never found herself crowded. Black blood tended to have that effect. She passed through all the layers of smell that made up a city. Baked bread, and the waking horses and wet stones, and hot metal and floral perfume, and old shit. The same smells you found in any city, but underneath them, the morning scent of the river. Sometimes, between the buildings, she could see the blades of the water wheel at the flour mill. Viv let the rod lead her where she wanted it. 
A few times, the tug was so strong she stopped and inspected the building nearby. But disappointed, she continued onward. The rod, the rod would resist for a while until it seemed to give up, finding a new direction in which to surge. At last, when it yanked hard, she came to a semi dazed stop and found what she needed. Not on the high street. That would be too much to hope for. But it was the only one removed. Kerosene street lamps dotted the length. Extinguished now. And like as not, you wouldn't be ni knifed there after dark. The buildings on Redstone showed their age, but the roof seemed in good repair. All except the one in particular. And here, the witching rod drew her closer. It was a small for what it was. A battered sign hung from the single remain iron eye hook. Parkins livery. The paint of the embossed letters long since flaked away. There were two large iron bound wooden doors, but they were ajar, and the cross beam was leaning against the wall nearby. Another smaller orc sized door was amusingly padlocked to the left of it. Viv ducked her head in for a look. Light filtered from a hole in the roof above, and a handful of clay shingles lay shattered. Across the broad alleyway, Leading six horse stalls, a ladder of dubious sturdiness led to a loft, and to the left, a small office with a back room. The sour smell of moldering hay came up from the trough at the back, dust swirled in beams of light as through it never settled. It was as perfect as she could hope for. She tucked the witching rod away. When she re-emerged re into the growing traffic of the street, she spied a knobbly old woman sweeping the stoop across the way. Viv was pretty sure she'd been sweeping since her arrival, the threshold no doubt sparkling at this point. But she continued to attack with determination, shooting Viv of a su super tenuous look every other second. Viv strode across the street. The old woman had the good grace to appear surprised, mustering something approaching a smile as she did. Do you know who owns this place? asked Viv, pointing back at the livery. The woman was less than half her height and had to crane to make eye contact. Her eyes disappeared as she compressed her face into a considered tangle of wrinkles. The livery? Yep. Well, she dragged the word out th thoughtfully, but Viv could tell there was nothing wrong with her memory. That old Ansem, if I recollect properly, never had much of a head for business. That man, not for trade nor husband's work, neither to hear his old lady tell it. Viv didn't miss the woman's suggestive pump of the eyebrows, not Parkin. Nope. T'was too cheap to change the sign when he bought it. Viv smiled, was amused. Her lower fangs prominent. Any idea where I could find him? Couldn't say for certain, but I imagine attending to the only work he never failed at. She tipped her free hand, bringing an imaginary tanker to her lips. You really want to find him? I tried the places on Rawbone Alley. Had about six over. She gestured to the south. At this time of morning? Oh, this business he's serious about. Thanks, miss, said Viv. Oh, miss, is it? Cackled the woman. You can call me Lainey. You planning to be my new neighbor? She made a give it over motion. Viv. Viv, said Lainey, nodding. I guess we'll see. Depends on whether she's a bad businessman, you say. The old woman was still laughing as Viv left for the rawbone alley. No matter what Laney said, Viv didn't really expect to find the much maligned Ansem at this time of day. She figured ask after him in a swill joint with an open door and, once she knew his haunts, track him down after the day wore on. Turned out, she only needed three stops before she found him. In residence, the tavern keep looked her up and down after she asked, raising an eyebrow, pointing at Black Blood's hilt over her shoulder. No trouble for me, just business, she said evenly. She tried to look less imposing. Apparently satisfied that she wasn't spoiling for a fight, he cocked a thumb at the corner and went back to swabbing the grime off the bar top into new and more interesting locations. As Viv approached the table, she got the overwhelming impression that she was entering the den of some elderly woodland beast. A badger, perhaps. Not a dangerous sense, but the feeling of a place where she spent so much time that had absorbed his smell and become essentially his. 
even looked like a badger. A big, greasy black beard striped with white tangled across his chest. As wide as was, he was tall. Occupied so much space between the wall and table that when he inhaled deeply, the thing rocked upon its legs. You Asmund? Ansem, she asked. Ansem allowed that he was. Mind if I sit? She asked and then sat anyway, leaning black blood against the back of the chair. Truth be told, she wasn't really accustomed to asking permission. Ansem stared at her over puffy lower lids. Not hostile, but wary. A tankard sat before him, nearly empty. Viv caught the tavern keep's attention and gestured at it. And Ansem brightened considerably. Much obliged, she muttered. I hear you own the old livery on Redstone. That true? asked Viv. Ansem allowed that he did. I'm looking to buy, she said, and have a feeling you might be looking to sell. Ansem seemed surprised, but only briefly. His gaze sharpened, and while he might not have had head for business, Viv was pretty sure he had one for haggling. Maybe, he rumbled. But that's some prime real estate. Prime? I've had offers before, but most of them don't seem past the place to really appreciate the value of the location. That is to say they say, they underbid. At this point, the tavern keeps swapped his tankard for a fresh one, and Ansem visibly warmed to his subject. Oh yes, so many embarrassing offers. I have to warn you. I know what that lot is worth, and I can't see myself selling to anyone but serious businessmen, eh? Businesswoman, he amended. Viv flashed her toothy and amused grin, thinking of Laney. Well, Ansem, there's all kinds of business. Very conscious of black blood leaning behind her, she thought of how easy her business, her old business, would have made this negotiation. But I can say for sure that when I do business of any kind, I'm always serious. She reached for her satchel, removed the purse of platinum chits and hefted it, withdrawing just one. She held it between thumb and forefinger, inspecting it and letting it catch the light. Platinum was a currency hardly ever seen in a place like this, and she'd need to exchange it for lower denomination soon. But she wanted some on hand just for this sort of moment. Ansem's eyes widened. Oh, ah, uh, serious, yes, serious, and to eat. He took a long pull of his beer to recover his surprise. So I dog thought, Viv trying not to smirk. As one serious business person to another, I don't want to waste your time. Viv leaned on an elbow and slid eight platinum chits across the table. That's probably eighty gold sovereigns. I think that covers the value of the lot. I'm sure we can agree that the building is a loss. I think the odds of another businesswoman tracking you down to pay cash on the barrel head is vanishing. She held his gaze. He stilled the tanker to his mouth, but wasn't swallowing. Viv began to withdraw the chits, and he hurriedly reached out, pulling up short before touching her much larger hand. She raised her eyebrows. I can see you've got a keen eye for value, Anson blinked rapidly. I do. If you want to take a moment this morning to bring the deed and sign it over, I'll wait here. But I won't wait longer than noon. Turn out the old badger was a lot nimbler than he looked. As Viv made her mark on the deed and pocketed the keys, Ansem scooped the platinum into his purse, looking relieved the deal was complete. So, I didn't figure to be interested in livery work, he ventured. It was common knowledge that horses didn't like orcs much. I'm not. I'm opening a coffee shop. Ansem looked nonplussed, but why would you buy a horse stable for that? Viv didn't answer for a moment, but then she stared hard at him. Things don't have to stay as what they started out as. She folded the deed and tucked it into her satchel. As she left, Ansem hollowed after her. Oh, and hey, what in the eight hells is coffee? Viv had three more stops to make before returning to the livery. The exchange at the trade depot put some copper, silver, and gold in her purse, and then she was off to the Anthium at the small thematic university of the north bank of the river. She wanted to know the location anyway, in case she needed to do any reading. More importantly, the territorial post ran between the scattered anthurium and libraries in most major cities, and it was dependable. 
Those copper-clad steeples she'd made it easy to locate. Seated at one of the big tables between the shelves, she wrote two letters using a few sheets of her parchment. The smell of paper and dust and time put her mind in all the recent reading she'd done in a place just like this. A lifetime of training made her muscles and reflexes, and her hardness of mind traded for reading and planning and amassing details. She smiled ruefully as she wrote. The gnome at the post counter couldn't stop goggling at her as she was stamped the wax seal. The woman had to take the address twice. She was so flustered at seeing an orc in the building. I'm looking for a locksmith. Know of anyone reputable? The gnome's mouth hung open a moment longer, but she recovered herself and flipped through a directory behind the counter. Mark Evans' sons, she replied. 827 Mason's Lane. She gave some sketchy directions. If thanked her, and then left. Our Kevin Sons was there. As advertised, a silver and three copper lighter. She left with an enormous and quite heavy strong box under one muscular arm. Back at Parkins' livery, as the sun set, we've unlocked the box door, rebarred and stable doors, and hauled the strong box behind. An L shaped counter in the office. She stowed the deed and her funds inside, locked it, and strung the key around her neck. After some resting, with her feet and fingertips she found a loose flagstone in the main pathway between the stalls and flexing mightily. Levered up and out, she scooped earth from beneath and then carefully placed the scalvered stone in the hollow. Covering with the dirt, she replaced the flagstone and took a stiff and shedding stable broom to the area to ensure it looked undisturbed. She stared down at it for a few moments, all her hopes centered on this small stone. Buried like a secret heart in Parkins' livery. No, not a livery anymore. This place was Viv's. She looked around her place, not a temporary stop or a spot to sling her bedroll from one night hers. The brisk evening air swirled around the hole in the roof, so for tonight at least it would probably feel like any other night under the stars. Viv glanced up at the loft and the ladder leading to it. She tested one of the lower rungs with a foot, and it shattered like balsa. She snorted, unstrapped, black blood and with both hands tossed it into the loft, startling a bunch of pigeons that escaped through the roof. Gazing after it for a moment, she then unfurled her bedrolls in one of the stalls. There'd certainly be no campfire, and there was no lantern to speak of, but that was all right. In the dimming light, she surveyed the interior, had missed horses, apples, and antique, antiquity and the dust of neglect. She didn't know much about the buildings but it was clear that this one needed an unbelievable amount of work. But at the end of it, something she built up rather than it cut down. It was ridiculous, of course. A coffee shop in a city where nobody even knew what coffee was. Until six months ago, she'd never heard of it. Never smelled or tasted it. On the face of it, the whole new endeavor was ludicrous. She smiled in the dark. When at last, she lay back on her bedroll. She started to list her task off for the following day, but didn't make it past the third. She slept like the dead. Chapter 2 Viv woke up the pre-dawn indigo to the growing murmur of the city outside. The pigeons cooed in the loft where they returned to the nest. She rose and checked on the flagstone above the scarlet stone, undisturbed, of course. Gathering a few things, she slipped into the street, chewing the last of her hard tack and inhaling moist morning scent of shadows giving way to the sun. She felt limber and coiled, like she was up on her toes, ready to break into a sprint. Across the street, Lenny had swapped a broom for a bowl of peas and sat on the three-legged stool shelling them. They treated amiable nods and then Viv locked up and left in the direction of the river. She found herself humming as she walked. In the receding morning fog, Viv made her way to the shipyards clinging to the bank of the river. The place was alive with the clatter of hammer and saw, shouts muffled by the mist. What she wanted was fixed in her mind. But she didn't expect to find it right away. She could be patient, though. In her experience, you had to be. The long hours spent reconsidering or staking out a beast's lair, if it made peace with the passage of time. She bought some apples from a ratkin urchin hawking them, from a burlap sack, found a stack of crates out of the way, and settled it to observe. 
The boats here weren't large, mostly keelboats and little fishing boats best suited to the river. A dozen or so were up on the long quay, attended by small knots of shipwrights being scraped or teared or repaired. She watched them as they worked, keeping an eye out for what she wanted. The crews ebbed and swelled as the morning progressed. Viv was on her last apple when she found what she'd been looking for. Most of the crews worked in twos and threes, big men with big voices, scrambling over the hulls and hollering to one another as they did. A few hours on, through the, a man of smaller stature appeared, hauling a wooden box of tools, half as large as himself. His ears were long, body wiry, skin leathery and olive, with a flat cap pulled over his brow. You didn't see Hobbs often in cities. Humans despairingly called them pucks and shunned them, so they liked to keep to themselves. Biff could relate, but she was more difficult to intimidate. He labored alone at a small dinghy, while shipwrights and dock workers alike avoided him. She watched his diligent, fast, tedious work. Viv was no woodworker, but she could appreciate craft. His tools were meticulously organized, sharp, and well cared for. There was a deliberate economy to his every motion, as he used a drawing knife and plane and other things she didn't recognize to shape a new gun well. She polished off her apple and watched him at his work, trying not to be too conspicuous about it. Lurking was a well-used part of her skill set, after all. It was noon when he tidily replaced his tools and unwrapped a lunch from his toolbox, and Viv appeared. He squinted up at her from under his cap, but said nothing as she loomed over him. It's nice work, said Viv. Mm -hmm. At least I expected is. I don't know much about boats, she admitted. I expected that dolls to compliment to touch them, he replied, his voice dry and deeper than she'd expected. She laughed and then looked up and down the quay. Not many here that do the work alone. Nope. You get a lot of work? He shrugged. Enough. Enough so you wouldn't like to have a lot more. He removed his cap, and then his look was more speculative. For someone who don't know much about boats, seems odd you're expecting to need much ship writing. Viv dropped to her haunches, tired of towering over him. Well, you're right. I don't. But woods, woods, and crafts, crafts. I watched you work. Live long enough, you realize some folks can be handed a problem and some tools and they'll sort it out. And I never think twice about hiring that sort of fellow. Although... She reflected the tools and fellows had been historically a lot larger and a lot bloodier. Mm -hmm, he said. I'm Viv. She held out a hand. Calamity. His own callous pause was swallowed by hers. Her eyes widened. Hobname, he said. You can call me Cal. Whichever you like best. I don't need your name to suit me. Cal's fine. The other two, much a mouthful. He folded the linen back over his lunch, and then she now felt that he had his full attention. So this work. At a here and now sort of prospect, or he flapped his hand to some vaporous future. Here and now, well paid and with the supplies you ask for, not the ones I choose for you. She withdrew her purse, opened it, removed a gold sovereign and extended it to him. Cal hung out his hands and though to catch a toss, but she deliberately placed it in one palm. He pursed his lips and bounced it in his hand. So why me exactly? He made to hand the coin back to her, but she declined. Like I said, I watched you work. Sharp tools. You clean as you go. Your mind's on your business. She looked around at the conspicuous absence of men nearby, and you do it even when some might say it's wiser not to. Hmm. So you want me for my lack of wisdom, eh? It ain't boats you want built. What exactly have you got in mind? I think I have to show you. Rack and ruin, Cal swore under his breath. He removed his cap to tuck it into the top of his breeches. They stood outside Parkins' livery. The stable doors thrown wide and Viv experienced a moment twist of uneasiness. Don't know much about roofing, he said as he peered up at the hole. But you can figure it out. <laughs> he replied and what Viv was coming to understand was an affirmative. He walked slowly around the interior, kicking at the stall panel, stomping on the flagstone. Viv tensed when he walked over the one above the scalloped stone. He peered back at her. How many you planned to hire? You have someone you'd like to work with? I'm not opposed. Other than that, I'm ready a pair of hands and I don't tire easy. 
She held them up in demonstration. It's not a livery. I'm one and go. No? Ever heard of coffee? He shook his head. Well, I need a restaurant, I guess, for drinks. Oh. She went to her satchel and withdrew a set of sketches and notes. Suddenly, she was unaccountably nervous. Vivian never cared much for the judgment of others. It was pretty easy to ignore when you had three feet and six stone on most of the folks you encountered. Now, though, she wondered that a small man would think her a fool. Cal was waiting for her to continue. She found herself rambling. I came across in Azimuth, the gnomish city around the East Territory. I was there for a, well, it doesn't matter what I was there for. But I smelled it first, and I came across the shop, and they made, well, it's like tea, but not like tea. It smells like... She stopped. And it doesn't matter what it smells like. I can't describe it anyway. At any rate, imagine I'm opening a tavern, but with no taps, no kegs, no beer, just tables to a counter. Some room in the back. Here I did some sketches of the place I saw. She thrust the papers at him and felt color rising in her cheeks. Ridiculous. He took the pages and examined them, paying careful attention to each as though he were committing every line to memory. After several agonizing minutes, he returned them. Those your sketches? Not bad. If anything, she flushed hotter. And you're planning to stay here too? He cocked a thumb at the loft. Seem that's Sweden? I yes. He put his hands on his hips and stared into the bay where the stalls stood. She'd half expected him to turn on his heel and leave, but now she was beginning to think. She might have chosen just right. So, he walked around the space again. Seems you could keep the stalls, cut them down some, tear out the doors, box it along the walls for benches. Take some long planks and set them on, on a trestle in between. And you got yourself some booths and a tables here along the sides. Tear down that wall into the office. The counter might do. Need to check for rot. He kicked at the splintered wood from the ladder and raised his eyebrows at her. Gonna need a new ladder. A couple bags of nails, whitewash, paint, clay tile. Some river stone, bags of lime. Might want a few more windows in this place and a lot of lumber. So you'll do it? He gave her another one of his long, speculative looks. What'd you say? I do things when it seems wiser not to. Well, if you're helping, I guess so. Give me some of that parchment and a stylus if you've got it. We're gonna need a list. A long list. Tomorrow, we can see about getting the orders filled and how much flatter we can make that purse of yours. For the first time since she'd met him, he offered a thin little smile. Not gonna ask how much it'll cost. Do you figure you even know yet? Don't suppose I do? Well then, if dragged an old tack crate away from the wall, blew away the dust, and handed him a stylus. They bent over the parchment together as Cal started writing. Cal left in the late afternoon to complete his work on the dinghy, promising to return in the morning. Viv tucked away the materials list and then stood in the hush of the livery, where the low noise outside seemed hardly to intrude. She looked out the doors and across to Laney's porch, but found it empty. She suddenly felt very alone, which was odd. Viv spent plenty of time with no company to speak of. Long treks, lonely campgrounds, cold tents, dripping caves. But in a city where she was almost never alone, one of her crew would have been with her. Now in this city, filled with people of all races and backgrounds, the solitude was terrible. She knew three people by name. None of them were really more than an acquaintance, although Laney seemed friendly at least, and Cal was strangely calming to be around. She locked up and headed towards the main thoroughfare, pointed away from the rawbone alley. You feel you need company. Well, fine. Here we are. New place, new home. For good this time. They found the brightest, loudest establishment she could. A restaurant and pub that seemed to do good business. With no staggering drunks in the street, out front and no puddles of piss to step over, she tucked into the lintel and entered, and there was a momentary drop in the conversational volume. Bethune was pretty cosmopolitan, and orcs weren't unknown, just a little unusual. The noise picked up right back up. She took a deep breath and tried to relax her face into a non-threatening expression. 
something she'd been practicing, not hauling a great sword around and wearing plain clothes hoping it added to the effect. There was a long, clean bar top, sparsely populated, and a mirror on the wall behind. Lanterns blazed throughout the dining area. It wasn't cold enough for a fire, but the room was still cheerfully lit. The tables were mostly occupied. Viv drew up a stool at the bar top, tried not to fidget. She felt awkward. So many people. So close. For the first time, she wasn't just passing through. Suddenly seemed that any faux pass or stumble here might follow and shame her forever. Before she'd even properly settled down, a rational through and through thought was. A moon-faced man approached, red-cheeked, his ears just a touch pointed. Probably a little elf in him, though his girth hinted at a very human metabolism. Evening, ma'am, he said, and slid a chalk slate menu in front of her. Eating or drinking? Eating, she smiled, not trying to bear her lower fangs too much. His expression didn't change a whit. Wrapping a knuckle on the slate, he said, The pork's good, I'll let you think on it, and breezed away. When he returned minutes later, she ordered, the pork, while she waited for her meal, she gazed around, musing. She hadn't dared to think this far ahead before, except in very abstract ways. But with Cal signed up, she allowed herself to dream on it a little. The cafe she'd visited, Esmith, had been this, the very definition of gnomish architecture. Precisely fitted wall tiles, geometric shapes, and pavers arranged in intricate interlocking patterns. The furniture had, of course, been gnomish in scale as well. She had to stand. She'd known her place would be a different, but now she tried to make that real in her head. She looked at the decorations inside the pub. Here an oil painting in an old gilt frame. There were a huge ceramic vase on the floor with fresh ferns to sweeten the air. A simple chandelier with three fat candles clearly changed regularly with no sloppy wax threads. Viv began to imagine her own place. Brighter, she thought, with all that tall barn ceiling, some light coming from the high windows. She could see what Cal had meant about the booths as well, but maybe another long table down the middle with benches and kind of community seating. Viv saw it with a big stable door thrown wide, perhaps a few tables in the entry to catch the breeze and the sun, the flags, stones, polished, clean, whitewashed walls. Her thoughts were interrupted by the arrival of, of her meal, the rich smell of it reaching her first. She discovered that she was ravenous. Before you go, she said, I wanted to ask, is this your place? The half-elf blinked and then smiled a little wider than his regular professional pleasantness. Sure is, four years now. You don't mind me asking, how'd you get started? He leaned on the bar top. Well, it's not a family business if that's what you're asking. My first place sure wasn't here on the high street. He chuckled at that. And was business slow at first, or did they all come at once? She waved at the room. Oh, my slow. Very slow. Fair to say I lost more money than I could afford to, and then I lost some more. But these days, I just lose enough to get by. You're planning to open a pub around here? Can't say I'd advise it, he winked at her, clearly joking. Not exactly, but maybe something like it. He seemed surprised, but recovered swiftly. Well, best of luck to you, ma'am. He spoke behind his hand in a stage whisper. I'll thank you not to take my customers, though, here. Not much chance of that, I don't think. Well, that's all right, then. Eat up now, or it'll get cold. Viv quietly ate her meal and didn't speak to anyone else. Her mood was meditative as she left the pub. She found a chandelier shop, still open, bought a lantern, and returned to the livery. There she lay awake, staring into its flames. The visions of what might someday be were far from cold and derelict place where she bedded down. Tomorrow, though, the will work would begin.